And so at a time in an era where there's an assumption that people's attention span is shortening, actually we see people who come in for an hour's visit and they leave four hours later because there's such fascinating content which they want to explore. Irishness is a story we tell ourselves about who we are, but it's important to me to say that it's not a genetically observable phenomenon. Hi, this is Martin Nutty, and that first voice you heard was Patrick Green, CEO of EPIC, the Irish Immigration Museum. And his second voice was the museum's historian in residence, Morris Casey. I'm John Lee, and welcome back to Irish Stew. This episode of Irish Stew is sponsored by the Irish Heritage Tree Program. Celebrate your Irish roots by planting native trees for family and friends in the beautiful Golden Vale of Ireland. Go to irishheritagetree.com and use the exclusive discount code today. It's Irish Stew 10 for 10% off. That code again is Irish Stew and the numeral 10. Keep the heritage of Ireland green and growing by going to irishheritagetree.com. Hey, this is uh, Martin Nutty with the Irish Stew Podcast, and welcome back to another episode. And I'm joined by my partner in crime, John Lee. John, welcome. Thanks, Martin. Good to be back with you. And, you know, today we're going over to Dublin. But in a sense, we're going all around the world with our global Irish conversation. We're going to go to the EPIC, the Irish Immigration Museum, and talk to Patrick Green, the CEO and museum director, and Morris Casey, the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs historian in residence. Welcome to you both. Thank you, John. Thank you both. Great to be here. Well, we're going to get to know more about your really fascinating careers, amazing resumes for you both. I'm going to start off with uh, with you, Patrick, and ask you. Well, let's say let's put it this way: you, you know, when you come up with the, the the image of a museum, for a lot of people, it's a big hall, slightly dusty, a few objects freestanding in the room, lots of glass cases with small objects and little ID cards next to them saying uh, circa year 1100 and with guards around telling you not to touch things. How does that perception play out at Epic? Uh, That is a stereotypical view, of course, (laughs) and um, the museum movement has moved on tremendously. So today, museums are incredibly popular in every part of the world. Uh, Developing countries, one of the first things that they decide to do is um, have a museum, because museums are a powerful means of communication. And also, every survey that I have seen shows museums as one of the most trusted sources of information. And that's crucial at a time when so many other sources of information can be very misleading. Uh, so, uh, so when you then get to Epic, Epic is uh, an extraordinary museum in an extraordinary place because it's located in the wonderful vaults that used to contain whiskey and other such um, goods. Uh, of a very large warehouse near the River Liffey, uh, which was built 200 years ago and which has been rescued, restored. And the basement, as I say, contains the museum. And the museum takes people on journeys of people who themselves have had journeys because it is a museum of emigration. And the stories that it tells are those of the Irish how and why they left Ireland, and then what happened to them when they arrived in all sorts of different countries where they made a contribution. So that's basically what um, Epic's all about. And it does all this through uh, digital technology. Mm. Um, So it's very different to a conventional museum, uh, and we get a fantastically positive response from our visitors. So I'm going to bring in uh, Morris into this uh, conversation, Um, uh, and and Morris is a little bit younger than the other three gray hairs that are on (laughs) here. Um, So a couple of things. Um, 
John probably knows I like to play three degrees of separation. And uh, I was reading in your bio, Morris, that you grew up in care. That's in right. Tipperary. Yeah. Uh, you're Casey. Mm -hmm. And actually, I have Casey family from Templemore. Oh, wow. Which is, uh, probably it's not that far away. And so uh, I have to ask, uh, have you got your DNA done and can we compare it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, I have not got my DNA done, but we can kind of, but, but uh, yeah, there's a high likelihood that there's definitely a connection. There's not too many cases around Tipperary, so for sure. Yeah. Um, so my roots stretch back down to there into the, the late 1700s, uh, which is about as far back as most, let's, let's call it uh, impoverished. I wouldn't say uh, the family was impoverished, but certainly not wealthy Irish. It's difficult to kind of get back you know, much earlier than that. But, but, but let me ask you this. Um, we live, uh, a lot of times people will say we live in an age of digital distraction. Mm -hmm. uh, you've chosen to make a career in history. Mm. Um, how do you get people to pay attention to nuance, to detail, which is at the core of great history mm, mm. in this kind of era of social media, you know, with Twitter's flying and brief Instagram posts. Yeah, that's interesting, Martin. I think we're really lucky in Ireland and the diaspora that we have a really kind of historically engaged community. Um, I think that Irish people and Irish people abroad are really interested in the story of of what you might call both roots, that is to say, um, where we come from, and also roots, I think, in terms of or O U T E S, those journeys that we've taken. Um, and you know, for me, it, it's really there's this idea that history um may just be for a kind of an older audience, but I think actually, you know, I'm 28. I think that people my age, people younger are really, really interested, particularly in stories of diversity um, in terms of diversifying our idea of, of Ireland's past and diversifying our idea of who the diaspora is and who makes up the diaspora. So I found in since I joined the team at Epic in uh, the summer of 2020, just people really interested in these more, more diverse histories of Ireland and the Irish abroad. So uh, maybe I want to throw a question to both of you, okay? I, I had the pleasure of, of visiting Epic all too briefly back in November, and uh, your colleague Dara Doyle was very kind to, to give me a flying visit, and I'm looking forward to coming back and uh, kind of engaging in a deeper level. But tell me a little bit about the visitor base uh, to Epic, right? It strikes me that there are people coming to Ireland maybe for the first time uh, and they're tracing, you know, their roots back to Ireland. There strikes me that there are people coming to Ireland that have absolutely no roots to Ireland. And then there is the Irish of Ireland themselves. How do those three communities engage with the museum? Well, what we found is that our audience is actually changing. And indeed, it has had to change over the last two years because, of course, with the coronavirus pandemic, um, our biggest source of visitation from overseas, America, has virtually disappeared. We get a, a few visitors from Europe, but fundamentally it was important that we engaged with a domestic audience, um, and that has worked out really well for us. So um, normally uh, something like 45... Uh, 75% 70, of our visitors were from overseas. So if we had um, simply lost 75% of our visitation, we would be in a serious trouble. But now Irish people living in Dublin or further away have discovered that um, this is a museum for them. It's a museum that they can recommend to other people to come to. And in consequence, we have built up that audience tremendously. And one of the ways of doing that has been to do a great number of things online. Um, with You can do an online visit to the museum. You can participate in all sorts of educational activities. So we get lots of kids involved and their parents when homeschooling during lockdowns. 
And also uh, we do programs of uh, lectures and Morris is one of our key performers there. So, um, for example, before we would we would meet people face to face for lectures and, and get maybe 40 or 50 people. Morris has had as many as 500 people from all over the world in the diaspora to listen to him about the fascinating uh, stories that he's uncovered. Yeah, I was just going to jump in there, kind of on that point and thinking through these audiences. Our lecture series, which is on the Epic YouTube channel that we did last year, Hidden Histories of the Irish Abroad, we were looking at different ideas of the diaspora. So we had one lecture on the Irish and African diaspora, the Irish Jewish diaspora. And what's been really interesting on the comment section of those videos and in my own personal email account and, and DMs on Twitter are people saying, I found this talk because this is my family history, because I am Irish Jewish, or I've just done a DNA test and I've, I'm an African American who's learned that I have Irish ancestry. So it's interesting that people are also sort of finding epic through those talks, but first beginning with the kind of a discovery of, of Irish family history too. Well, let's get into a little bit why 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 you two gentlemen are, are uh, the folks we're talking to today. How you found yourselves at this new museum, and uh, Patrick, I'll start with you. I mean, really a fascinating background, and let let's look at it in terms of how it led you to the spot you're in today. I have to start off with the Leeds University degree in food and leather science. That one took <laughs> me by surprise. Well, while I was doing that degree, I became uh, heavily involved in archaeology as as a volunteer, uh, to a point at which uh, an obsession became a profession. <laughs> and um, so, when I left university, I because I virtually worked um, an apprenticeship on archaeological sites, I was able to direct. Uh, excavations on sites which were going to be developed uh, before the, the bulldozers moved in. And that led me to the opportunity to excavate a medieval monastery in, in the northwest of England, where I was approached by the Development Corporation to say, here's a contract for you for six months, which I grabbed with both hands. Um, and six months turned into 12 years. The project turned into the largest excavation by modern standards of a monastic establishment um, in Europe, uh, and it turned into a museum as well. So we had a museum on the site. So museums found me rather than me going searching for them. Having uh, done that, I then went to um, Manchester, where I directed the, the development of a new museum of science and industry in the buildings of the world's oldest railway station. Um, and that was a fascinating job, which I did for 19 years, raising the money, doing step-by-step -step development about this uh, fascinating city of Manchester. And then the phone went, was I interested in working in Australia, particularly in Melbourne? And I'd been to Melbourne and with my wife for a conference. And when we were there, we said, look, if the right job came up, this would be a great place to live. And that's the way it turned out. And so I, I ran the um, Museums Victoria, which consisted of a number of museums and an IMAX cinema and, and other things, um, and uh, did that for 15 years. Then my cousin, Mervyn Green, who had been um, developing Epic, said to me, Patrick, I'd like you to take over from me as museum director and and CEO of Epic. Um, are you interested? Which which I was, and so arrived here just over two years ago with uh, my wife and uh, our son Dominic, who's um, now eleven years old. And um, I, I've absolutely loved the two the two years I've spent here. So the, here it's been a bit of a family. Uh, connection, which brought me here. But it, as somebody with Irish roots, I've been very thrilled, actually, to be able to work with this amazing museum here in Dublin. 
that's my that's my story in a nutshell. Well, I'm sure in a nutshell because it's really an amazing uh, combination of uh, museum experiences and also that that idea of really starting museums. You know, uh, building something out of nothing is that's a pretty unique skill set. And you mentioned the uh, the virtual tours. I, I didn't get a chance to go to the museum, but I did take the virtual tours, so I feel like I have a, a sense of what goes on. And as far as the space. A few years ago, I was in the restaurant next door. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. The, the, uh, Ellie's, is it? Uh, was it? Urban. Urban, yes. Yeah. And so I was in the vaulted the vaulted spaces, so I have a sense of it. But anyway, so Martin, why don't you pick it up? Very atmospheric, as you, as you experience. Love it. Yeah, I, lo- I love the space. Um, I, I'm going to switch back uh, over to Morris. Um I was kind of fascinated. I, I was stalking you on LinkedIn <laughs> on your uh, profile there, and I kind of wondered what, what you set a new record for. You know, getting a bachelor's, master's, and PhD in terms of uh, timing. It, it struck me that that was a pretty uh, uh, high speed uh, education. I can't remember it was two thousand and twelve to two thousand and eighteen or something. And just to let our listeners know, uh, Mars went to. Trinity. I think it was a stop at St. Andrews. He was in Cambridge, and then he finished up with his PhD in Oxford, which kind of uh, you know, some pretty impressive institutions. So uh, was speed uh, always on your mind? <laughs> well, it was, um, it was, it was, so let's see, it was 2011 to, to 2020, but yeah, it was, so I was in, I was in full-time education from the age of four until the age of 26 <laughs> so it was pretty <laughs> long um but i yeah so i began my undergrad in history and english and then i did my masters in modern european history at cambridge and then i did my phd at oxford uh, which included four months at stanford and one month at the moscow state institute for foreign relations and uh, in that like I got my PhD done under the four year mark. I got it done in um, three years um, and four months, and I also learned Russian in that period as well. So it was it was pretty full on and intense, but I, I had a lot of fun. And then I started this role uh, just a few months after finishing my PhD. I did come across on, on your lovely website uh, some articles on uh, the Irish in the common turn. Uh, which I thought was an interesting space. So that kind of explains to me a little bit more uh, your focus on that. Um, and it's it's actually, that's an interesting piece of history to me mm-hmm. because of the fraught relationship between kind of uh, socialism and Catholicism in Ireland and then this expression uh, of the let's say, suppressed socialistic instinct of certain Irish people that resulted in them fetching up in, I guess, Petrograd or St. Petersburg, whichever way you want to go, or or Moscow. Yeah. Um, So can you tell me just a little bit about that research? Yeah, sure. So my PhD topic was um, on Irish women and radical politics in the 1920s and the 1930s. And I think a lot of my interests arose from this very kind of basic um, fascination that I had, which was that right, the Irish Revolution begins in 1916 and the Russian Revolution begins in 1917. So surely there's going to be crossover and surely they're part of a, a, a worldwide revolutionary wave. So how can we find the connections between the two? And then I started looking more and more into, um, I always had this fascination with Russia. And when I, I learned Russian because of that fascination, and that allowed me to just look at Russian archives and see where are the Irish links. And when I finally got to Moscow in 2018, they had this really amazing series of of folders, which were basically arrival forms for people emigrating from Ireland to Soviet Russia, the earliest of which went back to 1921. And I was just interested in what are the sort of what are the nature of these people's lives? What leads you from Ireland to Soviet Russia? What is your background? And so basically a lot of my research involved doing really deep dives, starting with these arrival questionnaires in many cases, and fleshing out who these people were and what brought them to Soviet Russia, what their experiences were in Russia, where they lived, and and whether they returned. And that really 
was the the kind of crux of my PhD. But yeah, as you say, it's it's interesting to think of Ireland, which is kind of traditionally seen as this Catholic or almost a conservative revolutionary state, and how people found an affinity with Russia. One of the arrival forms was very funny, actually. When you arrived in the Soviet Union, you had to note where you had been in the past, where you'd spent significant amount of times before you'd arrived to the Soviet Union. And this young guy, I think he arrived in Moscow in 1932 to study. When he was asked where he had been before, he replied that he had been in France, in Lourdes, on a pilgrimage. So mm. his only experiences <laughs> abroad were on a pilgrimage to Lourdes and doing a revolutionary training course in Moscow. So that to me is just an, an incredible life story. Yeah, because there was so, so much hostility uh, expressed or directed, uh, as I understand it, by the Catholic Church against anything that would smatter of socialism at the time, certainly in the newly independent state of the 1920s and 1930s. And so you have this very odd juxtaposition of, in many respects, intensely Catholic, predominantly men, also with these kind of, you know, this kind of revolutionary communistic drive. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it's an interesting uh, balance. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to switch back over to, to John here. Yeah, you know, um, Morris, there's just, there's just one thing about your, your impressive resume. I, I really uh, grabbed me. Your ability to discern a butter bean from a barlotti bean, <laughs> which is yeah. not the kind of thing you usually see on LinkedIn, which I thought was really cool. <laughs> so how, do you, how, how did you come up with this skill? And, you know, does that kind of experience inform what you're doing now? Well, yeah, so that's uh, I that's kind of a joke on my LinkedIn profile. I, I try not to take LinkedIn too seriously. So I put in, there's a few jokes there, a few kind of Easter eggs for people who take a dive. But that's because I used to work at a vegetarian restaurant during my undergrad. So um, Cornucopia, which is a great vegetarian restaurant, I worked there during my undergrad. And that's how I learned to design discern all the various kinds of beans and their differences. Um, I also had some uh, some celebrity encounters there. I served Robert Plant a plant based dish. That's my great claim to fame. My time there, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> whether that um, informs my research, I guess I um, that was a very cosmopolitan workplace, and I'm interested in particularly. Uh, more and more so how a museum of emigration can also tell a broader migration story about the the contributions of migrants within Ireland. And I think that that kind mm -hmm. of, those early days working in that cosmopolitan workspace, I was thinking, actually, Ireland is a very diverse country. There's so many languages here. And actually, there's a longer history um, of migration to Ireland. The 1911 census, the second largest foreign-born population are migrants from the Russian Empire. And you wouldn't consider, when you think, the Irish Revolution occurs in a city that has, uh, you know, hundreds of Russian people living in it. And how does that impact Irish history? So I guess that's where that kind of experience links into what I do now. And then I think perhaps maybe a little customer service, customer experience uh, orientation that probably plays out in the museum. So <laughs> let's, let's, let's go back, let's go down into the basement and step into Epic with, and start off with the question, why the name Epic? You know, a lot of museums have a, like the, you're uh, across town, the Moley Museum, the Museum of Literature, uh, Ireland, which I, I got to see, I really love. So I was trying to work out, well, what did these Epic initials stand for? Clearly I was on the wrong track. W why Epic? Um, I think simply because it was a good name. It was a, uh, the story of the Irish in the, around the globe is an epic story. Um, Subsequently, uh, some words have been sort of tacked onto it, which is every person is connected. But actually, that, that isn't because, so epic isn't because of those words. It's the other way around. So, but it, it served us very well. You know, it's four, four letters in a title is really excellent. And during my, my museum career, I, I, I found that the shorter title you can use the more successful a project's going to be. So that in Melbourne, uh, in, in Melbourne Museum, we had uh, touring exhibitions. So Tutankhamun, one word, everybody knows what it is. Um, Titanic, we had, we had the Titanic exhibition, one word. Pompeii, one word. So epic, just four letters, suits us very well. 
you had concepts as the museum was developed. Are there things that have taken you by surprise in terms of the visitor experience? Are there places that visitors gravitate around that kind of you were surprised or some elements that they sort of walked by and you wonder why they didn't stop and look? Well, one of the things which um, is impressive is the fact that uh, during normal circumstances, when we can welcome people from everywhere, we get lots and lots of visitors from from Europe uh, who have no Irish in their, you know, in their history or their genealogy, but nonetheless um, love Epic and finish up saying um, they wish they were Irish. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that's pretty funny, but but um, but but in parallel with that is the fact that you know if if you take m- most countries, pretty well everywhere has uh, an emigration story of some sort or another. So you take Sweden for example, and huge numbers of people left Sweden to go to America when Sweden was a very poor country, and that's replicated by many other countries. So people can find themselves in it, even if they're not part of the Irish story. And that's great. I love that. I love, I love anything which surprises us and, um, and, and combats, if you like, a stereotypical image of, of what our, our global diaspora is like. This is a general question to both you gentlemen. Would it be fair to say, though, that... Ireland as a country is much more dramatically impacted by emigration with an E, uh, meaning people leaving the country, than most other countries by virtue of its kind of sad history. Um, well, is that your read of it? I think Morris, Morris can answer some of that, but I'll start off by saying that, um, yes, I mean, the scale of, of migration from Ireland was has been over the years absolutely enormous. Um, it's not only the Great Famine, bad that that was. It, it it's you know my my father was one of ten children, uh, on a, from a farm in County Clare. Of those ten children, only one could continue with the farm. So the other nine had to make their way in the world, and literally the world. And so he he left. He became a, per, a nurse in Britain, as many other migrants did. Um, and that story is repeated again and again. But the population of Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, passed uh, five million uh, just a few few weeks ago, um, and that takes it to back to a population uh, in the nineteenth century. You know, that was the last time Ireland had a population that size. So it'll tell you how many people left in the meantime. But Morris will have some uh, comments on that, I'm sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, I do think that the Irish experience is in many ways uh, very particular, Um, particularly when you think of Ireland, uh, kind of going back to what Patrick was saying there, you know, it, it must be the only European country that exits the 19th century with less people than it entered the 19th century with. And that is, of course, due to the famine and due to the emigration that rolls on after the famine and continues on after the famine. And what that does as well, it creates this this diaspora, right? And diaspora, etymologically as a word, means scattering. And, you know, I like to say that a diaspora is not born, it's created. People put the work into creating a diaspora. And this generation during and after the famine, particularly that generation in the US, created a political idea of Irishness that shaped the development of Ireland and the Irish abroad in very complex and important ways. So I think that absolutely that that capital E emigration story from Ireland creates a very particular phenomenon in Irish history and in world history, which is the Irish diaspora as a kind of a constructed idea, because not every country has a diaspora, right? We talk about the Jewish diaspora, talk about the African diaspora. And that is referring to a specific kind of community that has um, its own shared history, um, in many cases, kind of common ideas and ideas of return and so on. And I think that, yes, that those particular events in the 19th century create that Irish diaspora, which has enormous importance in terms of how history, not just in Ireland, but in the world, develops afterwards. 
You know, it's interesting when you, you know, you highlight three of the probably better known diasporas and I associate all three of those with pain, uh, meaning the pain of famine, and let's say political oppression in Ireland, you know, from a colonial experience. Uh, let's say the pain of anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Jewish people experienced and obviously the pain of slavery that Africans experienced. Is there a diaspora that's not rooted in pain that you can think of? Because it seems to me that people only ever upsticks when things are not good at home. Yeah, I mean, I think that in its root, if diaspora is an idea of scattering, then what causes scattering? I don't think that there's sort of a, I don't think there's a kind of a positive force that can cause a community to separate and fragment. Um, I think that, uh, you know, what is interesting in terms of thinking about the 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 story of emigration in Ireland is kind of interesting that a lot of early 20th century Irish nationalists were arguing that one of the main reasons that British rule should be overthrown in Ireland is that it will stop emigration that the, that Britain is in that British rule and British misrule is the cause of emigration and this in fact turned out to be not the case in the sense that independent Ireland actually saw an increased rate of emigration afterwards. But Ireland has turned from, from that idea where emigration was a kind of a political, you know, this thing that the politicians talked about as being, we need to stem this to almost being something that Ireland celebrates in a way. And that the diaspora becomes something that becomes a kind of a facet of Irish identity that isn't something that, um, that the kind of, everybody laments, but something that people celebrate. So that also is an interesting story. Um, and it's also tied into these kind of complex ideas about diaspora. In many cases, people in the African diaspora celebrate diaspora. People in the Jewish diaspora likewise celebrate the idea of a global community. Let's bring the conversation back to the museum and uh, how it tells the stories that, uh, how it ties together the threads we've just been discussing. You know, I, I, one of the early um, artifacts, not, you know, contemporary artifact that, that I saw in my virtual tour was that sculpture, sculpture representation of the, uh, the ships mm -hmm. sort of radiating outward. And that, that's that idea of scattering that you mentioned, Morris, would seem to be embodied there. Uh, maybe we'll use that uh, piece as a, as, a, as a point of departure to talk about the experience that you're presenting at Epic. Uh, yes, people encounter that sculpture, which is very, very beautiful sculpture. And as you say, it um, it shows ships, uh, or real ships. I mean, the, each of the ships which is in that sculpture uh, has a historical base to it, it's from um, St. Brendan all the way through to the present day. And the present day, we have some aircraft as well. Because you know this is a small island, and um, so to leave to leave for most of the you know the history of Ireland, you left by ship. So um, that is presented alongside um, a map which shows at the different different eras where people who left Ireland where they were settling. And, um, and so the two together is a, is a very vivid introduction to the fact that this is a museum about people leaving. Uh, and, and together with that, we have some, some film, historic film, which uh, shows people literally upping sticks and moving. Um, so that sets the scene. And then people move into a space where individuals talk to them talk to the visitors about their experience. Now, these, these individuals uh, are played by actors, but the people are real and the stories are real. So sometimes people say, well, how can you be a museum if you don't have any objects? Well, we're a museum of stories. And the stories carry, each story is representative of, you know, multiple other stories and trigger other stories. And one of the things which happens when people come around the museum, those, those with any form of Irish uh, antecedents in their family uh, want to share that with our staff. Um, and it turns into a conversation. And, and that is a very powerful way of communicating 
and communicating the extraordinary stories. It seems like a very Irish approach to a museum, the telling of stories. It's a very Irish approach. It's, it's a unique approach. And, and it's, it's one for us, three years running, Europe's leading visitor attraction in the World um, Tourism Awards, uh, which, which has delighted us. And which has given us um, a standing, which, which otherwise we would we would have taken twenty years probably to develop. Um, so yeah, so it, it is real people having real stories with a depth of information. There's so much information which people can access in the galleries. You know, letters written by um, emigrants, and so at a time in an era where there's an assumption that people can people's attention span is own is shortening. Actually, we see people who come in, uh, you know, for an hour's visit, and they li- they leave four hours later because there's such a fascinating um, content which they want to explore. Morris, are there any aspects of the uh, museum that you know from your that sort of resonate uh, alongside your own research, or kind of surprised you as you as you began to encounter them? Yeah, sure. Well, I'm I'm a huge fan of the um, most recent addition to the museum, uh, which is uh, our final gallery, which contrasts two stories of of emigration: one um, from the famine era and one from the present day. Um, and I it contrasts them, and it kind of comes back to a lot of what we were talking about earlier about how what it meant to leave by ship and what that meant in terms of the likelihood of you ever seeing your family again in the mid nineteenth century. Or how interconnected we are today as well. So um, I'm interested in, in those two ideas and those two contrasts, but also how we can kind of unpick those contrasts. Also, I'm very interested in in what it meant to travel by ship um, and what it meant in terms of Irish people's encounters with people from other countries and so on, and what it meant to actually be forced to spend weeks at a time um, thinking and, and talking, and how that shaped Irish history. Um, but also kind of coming up to the present day and our interconnectedness and the global nature of Irish identity, something that is reflected in that last gallery it features Emma Dabiri, who's a Nigerian Irish writer. Um, so I'm interested in how the place that the museum has in terms of talking about what is Irishness and who is Irish and who gets to be part of the Irish abroad and making that definition inclusive. So I think that that last gallery really kind of... Um, speaks to those ideas in in a really meaningful way. So I'll jump in here because this is obviously a subject that's, that's, you know, dear to both John and my heart, you know, is we're kind of a believer of a more expansive view of Irishness. Now, I grew up in Dublin and I'm used to, you know, the old saw in Dublin, especially, let's say, with the peculiar sense of humor in my home city. Uh, of the American visiting Ireland and declaring that they are Irish and the hackles of some wag in a Dublin pub, you know, uh, getting raised by this American saying, I'm Irish. Uh, So I'm kind of curious um, from both you gentlemen uh, to kind of give me a sense of what does Irish mean? Is it expansive? Uh, We've had a conversation with with Damien Shields um, about this, because he's a historian uh, specializing in the American Civil War and the Irish participation in that, and we kind of asked him that question, and he said, well, you can't go with nativity. He said, if you go with nativity, then I don't count. I was born in England, although I grew up in Ireland. So there is this tension, I think, between the native-born Irish and their diaspora, and I'm kind of curious to, to hear your thoughts along that front. Well, one, one observation is that um, the island of today is, is so different to the island, island that I first visited in the 60s. Um, and, and it is a multicultural uh, country. Uh, 17% of the population were born somewhere else. And they may well be people like myself with, with Irish roots, but who has, have only lived in Ireland for, for um, two years. Uh, although I've visited quite a lot of times prior to that. But the real illustration of this happened um, a week ago when we hosted uh, a citizenship ceremony 
where the Department of Justice um, staged the ceremony, which which normally would would gather, you know, th- three and a half thousand people together for a, a ceremony in a building. But this was all done online. But it was the most moving uh, experience to see all these people from every part of the world talking about how proud they were now that they were Irish and they had their certificate and they were pledging themselves to the state, the nation of Ireland. Um, And the fact that Ireland has this welcoming attitude to people from overseas is, is fabulous. But also um, part of the part of the approach to multiculturalism is look, if you become Irish, you don't have to leave your other identity behind. You can have both. And I think that is a fantastically constructive way of building a country which, you know, which these days is a very successful country with with a very successful multicultural approach. Not always, not always smooth, but um, essentially very welcoming. And the part of of, of Dublin and I live in, we have we have people from all parts of the world, and, my, and the school that my eleven year old goes to is very multicultural. Oh, and having left Melbourne, which itself is um, a superb multicultural community. It was a great relief that we could um, continue that expansionist um, idea of, of, of Ireland through through the schooling that our son goes to. Yeah, um, I guess I could kind of, I, I think about this question of, of Irishness quite a lot. Um, and for me, you know, Irishness is a story we tell ourselves about who we are. But it's important to me to say that it's it's not a genetically observable phenomenon, right? I, I, if I, I haven't taken a DNA test, but if I took a DNA test, I'm quite sure I'd have, you know, 80 to 90% Irish DNA. But I might have friends, I might know people who have parents from Russia or Barbados or, or anywhere in the world, and they grew up in Ireland and they're Irish and their DNA test probably isn't going to say you've got whatever percentage Irish DNA, but they're just as Irish as I am. And if it's a story we tell ourselves, then what's important is how we tell the story and and why it matters to us and what principles or guiding ideas it gives us about how we live our lives. So I've been doing a lot of research recently on on the Irish and African diasporas. And I'll tell you two stories from that research, which really kind of opened this idea to me. One of the things I do is that I pick a historical moment, which I find really fascinating, and I just try and find the Irish link. And one of those moments was the Harper's Ferry Raid, John Brown's Harper's Ferry Raid, which I know a lot of your US listeners will will know the kind of broad details of. <clears throat> uh, John Brown, a militant abolitionist who brought together a militia force to raid this armory in Harper's Ferry with the intent of hopefully inciting the enslaved population of the US to overthrow the system of slavery years before the Civil War broke out. And I was trying to think, okay, how can I find the Irish link to John Brown? And I was looking at the names of the raiders that joined him, one of whom was a Lewis Sheridan Leary. And I thought, wow, that's a really Irish name, <laughs> Sheridan Leary. There has to be a link there. But Lewis Sheridan Leary was actually one of the African-American raiders. And when I went into his family history, so I took his name to our, our colleagues at the Family History Center at Epic who do this amazing genealogical research. And I was like, what's this guy's Irish link? And as we were looking into it, you could see he had this really complex sort of family tapestry where his grandfather was likely, seems to have been the son of an Irishman, Jeremiah Leary. So he was Jeremiah Leary II. He married a woman who was half Croton Indian, half African American, which meant that they could legally marry because they could get around these uh, laws against um, white and and black marriage to marrying as an Indian woman and an Irish man. And then on his mother's side, it was African-American. So he has this tapestry of identity, which is Irish, Native American, and African-American. But in the John Brown raid, he doesn't die as an Irishman. He dies as an African-American. <clears throat> 
But afterwards in the family history, they talk about this link to Ireland and they talk about how this great grandfather, Jeremiah Leary, fought in the American Revolutionary War. So then they have this Irish revolutionary link, but then they, it, it's kind of enacted through this African-American identity, which to me is just fascinating that the, the one Irish link in the John Brown militia is actually one of the African-American raiders. Another person who's really fascinating to me is Pauli Murray. Pauli Murray is not so well known now, but was a kind of a leading African-American, um, I guess you could call her kind of a, a legal intellectual. She was a mentor to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And she wrote a book called Proud Shoes, um, which is regarded as one of the first sort of books of African-American genealogy. And she had grown up on the story that her, the father, her great-grandfather, the father of her grandfather was an Irish man from Kildare called Fitzgerald. Her grandfather was called Fitzgerald. And um, the story that she was told was that her grandfather Fitzgerald was the son of an Irishman and um, a free black woman. When she, did re- when she did the research and she had grown up with the story and all her aunts and uncles used to celebrate St. Patrick's Day and Irishness was this kind of important part of growing up for her. But when she researched the story, she found out that it may well not be the case. In fact, her grandfather who had raised them, telling them that she had grown up, um, that he had been free when he was, had been born free, actually was born enslaved, was enslaved by a Quaker person who manumitted him at the age of 21. So she actually learned that this Irish link may not be real, but yet Irishness was still important and Irishness was still a part of that family history, even though it may not actually, we may not be able to find the sort of trail of documents leading back to County Kildare in the 18th century. So those two stories to me really reflect how Irishness is actually something that a lot of people can claim. And I, I'm not prescriptive on who gets to claim it. That's for the Department of Justice and the Passport Office to deal with. For me, I'm welcoming to anyone who can who wants to tell a story about Irishness that is diverse, that is progressive, and that helps us understand the complexity of identity and how how you know identity can be so applicable and malleable and can mean different things at different times. So that that's kind of a long winded answer to that kind of question of Irishness. But that's just ideal conversation for what we do here on this podcast. And, uh, you know, one example of what you were talking about of looking at a name and trying to figure out the Irish relation, Barack Hussein Obama, mm-hmm. a genealogist who was able to, you know, trace him back to uh, uh, a gentleman named Carney. And Carney is one of my grandparents' names. So we're cousins until proven otherwise. But I'd like to go back to the museum one more time. You know, we've been talking about some very serious topics, some some tragedy, very, you know, kind of a serious look at the immigration experience. The museum looks like a lot of fun, too. Uh, I, I know there's that section on sort of, I'll just call it the river dance uh, part of the uh, museum, where there's the footsteps on the floor, where you can uh, kind of uh, walk on those footsteps and learn the steps of Irish dance. I, I, I just try to picture what kids are doing when they hit that part of the exhibit. It's a it's a bright, colorful place. It's It looks like a lot of fun, too. It is a lot of fun. And a story which I have told um, this week to my colleagues was about a, two weeks ago, um, I was walking through the museum, and I, and, and I do walk through every day, in fact, and... Um, there was a sort of thumping noise ahead. And when I got to the river dance part, there were two lads there, Down syndrome lads, and they were dancing their hearts off there. And it was an absolutely, you know, life-affirming moment to see these two young men um, enjoying enjoying, um, the museum and really reaffirming also that the museum is for everyone and that everybody can take a part out of it. So it is enjoyable. Um, people do get a lot of fun. Uh, but, but, you know, the fun and the serious, two sides of the coin, works, works very well. And we unashamedly uh, have a Santa experience running at the moment. We believe we have the best Santa in <laughs> in Dublin. <laughs> and um, I tell you, it's a sellout, an absolute sellout. And we do all this in the face of 
a pandemic in which so many people have had really tough times. And uh, the sanitary experience is something to bring joy to them. Uh, so, yeah, we like having fun. We like, we like doing uh, things like the exhibition that Morris uh, worked on about LG, LGBTQ plus activists of, of Irish origin and their contribution around the globe. That's a fantastic exhibition which um, has appeared in um, uh, Ireland's embassies and other missions around the world. Uh, through the Department of Foreign Affairs. Um, it was their idea to come on board with EPIC and and they have sponsored a historian in residence. Very enri- enlightened um, approach. And it's given us people like Morris who have found so many stories and enriched our understanding of Irishness. Mm. Yeah, thanks. I, I mean, the and out in the world, our, our LGBTQ plus diaspora exhibition is we're kind of speaking to as well in terms of this idea of of fun and what, what younger people get out of the museum. Because one of the things that that exhibition has is a story wall where people can post their kind of responses to the museum. And it's been great to see a lot of LGBTQ plus identifying um, younger people who said, you know, I came here with my parents. It's great that Ireland is such an accepting society now or you know, people from an older generation posting and saying, I left Ireland because of intolerance. And it's great that we can come back and come to a museum and see this kind of exhibition. So yeah, that for me is, has been the really kind of affirming encounters with visitors and, and seeing how they respond to those kind of stories too. You know, when I, when I think of Irish culture and, and Irish history, growing up in Ireland in the you know 60s, 70s and 80s, I was kind of impacted by essentially what, what is a horribly sad story. It's reflected to some degree in the music. Like if you think about, you know, traditional Irish music, how many traditionally Irish happy songs, you know, do you get? I think of Finnegan's Wake, which is like a happy song, but it's actually about a funeral, which kind of <laughs> illustrates my point. Um, that's about as happy as it gets. Uh, and, and Irish history itself is this kind of, you know, people will trot out 800 years of colonial oppression. But it strikes me that the museum is telling a more triumphant story of the Irish diaspora. And it strikes me that Department of Foreign Affairs sponsorship of your work, Morris, is an acknowledgement of the importance of Irish people laying claim to that diaspora. My sense is is that we're we're in the early innings of understanding how best to engage with the diaspora. And you guys are obviously, you know, having a significant impact on that. But what should be done to move the ball forward from both a native Irish point of view so that they begin to see the diaspora more as a resource or or something to engage in? Uh, You know, what needs to happen to kind of bind that a bit tighter. The DFA um, are very, very keen on Ireland communicating with the diaspora. And it is the unit in the DFA that, um, that, fu- that funds Morris and funds the exhibitions that we develop on the basis of the research by the historian in residence. And it is a very explicit um, desire for Ireland, a small country on the fringes of Europe, uh, to be seen um, globally. And and Ireland, of course, plays a very significant role as a neutral country in peacekeeping and all sorts of things like that. And um, one of the things which EPIC supported, uh, along with the DFA, was, uh, and, and, and in concert with the DFA, was um, getting the seat on the Security Council, which um, Ireland has at this at the moment, and Epic played a role in that because uh, every every group of overseas diplomats, politicians, and so on that came uh, were brought down to Epic um, because Epic was a perfect way of explaining. Um, you know, what the diaspora was all about, 
but also about the values that um, Ireland has as a, as a country. So um, all of that is really interesting, and it'll be very interesting to see how that continues to develop. As I say, you know, it's we're a small country, but the recognition of Ireland and Irishness is um, extraordinarily broad and and can be found in virtually every country. Mm-hmm. Well, folks, uh, we, we hate to get to this part of the episode, but the, it, we do end with a, on a positive note uh, where we offer you a chance to uh, participate in our Seamus plug. Uh, your chance to let people know what you know, any kind of uh, promotional message you might have, or anything you want to draw people's attention to. Okay, well, I'll start, uh, and that is to everybody who encounters this podcast. There's a really warm welcome uh, awaiting them when they come to Ireland and make um, Epic one of the first things they do when they visit Dublin. But they don't have to wait for that. They can visit us online. Um, And we have an online shop. So take a look at the online shop and buy, buy, buy. (laughs) And that's epichq.com. How how shameless is that? That's that's beautiful. Epichq.com. Anything from you, Morris? Yeah, I guess I'd just say to everyone, uh, again, to echo Patrick, say, uh, um, happy holidays to all listening in. And also, I would, if you're interested in anything that I've been talking about, uh, just the various kind of historical threads, look up the Epic YouTube channel, Epic, the Irish Immigration Museum, and check out our playlist of lectures, Hidden Histories of the Irish Abroad. I have a series of lectures on a range of different topics, like in Ireland, the Black Atlantic, Irish Jewish histories, Irish people in Russia. They're all free. Watch them, throw them on while you're cooking something up. And that's all I could ask for a bit of engagement with those because it's all about sharing the stories and getting them out there. So jump onto that YouTube channel or follow me on Twitter at Morris J. Casey. And I have one more question about getting visitors into uh, Epic. Uh, some advice uh, for what's the best way to book tickets. Uh, you know, as, let's let's en- let's envision tourism is back up and running full speed. How, how can we make sure that if you want to go to Epic, you can get in at the right time? And what's the best way to? Uh, the best way is to go online to our website. You just need to go on Google and put in Epic Museum. Uh, you'll find it. And uh, all the information is there. It, it, it's very easy. Uh, one of the things we introduced as a result of the pandemic was timed slots so people can book into particular slots, and this is for social distancing, of course. Um, so uh, that's the way to do it. In terms of tour tour organisers, um, as tourism re- returns, um, overseas tour operators uh, include Epic in their programmes increasingly, and, and since we won those awards, um, it has become a must a must-see part of a visit to Ireland. So um, there are lots and lots of ways of um, getting access, but fundamentally, have a look on the web uh, where there's lots and lots of uh, information. Yeah, as a a native-born Irishman who has lived in America for the last 38 years, um, as I mentioned during the show, I was like really lucky to uh, visit Epic, and I can't recommend it strongly enough. Uh, That's great. It's really enjoyable and immersive experience. So uh, a big shout out from my point of view. I like to think I wear both hats as both a member of the diaspora and a member of, of Irish people. And I think it offers so much to both of those communities if we're going to segment them. So on behalf of our listeners in the podcast, I'd like to thank Patrick Green and Morris Casey for giving us uh, their view of the diaspora history and letting us know about incredibly important cultural resource. It's been a real pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Martin. Thank you, John. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to participate in Irish stew. It's made me quite hungry for, for a bowl of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, likewise. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and uh, hopefully we get to chat again as well. Hopefully it's the first of a few conversations. We'll look forward to that. 
So, John, thoughts, please. You know, I worked in museums uh, at various stages in my career, so I really was getting into the conversation on that level. And what I was impressed with was how they are really redefining what a museum can be. It doesn't have have to be a place with artifacts. It can be a place that tells stories. I can't wait to see the museum. You already got a chance, but it sounds like they're able to tell the stories in ways that bring out different nuances, different colors, different shadings, and different meanings without really having cases of artifacts to look at, really an immersive experience and a new way of telling stories. Well, I was fortunate enough, as you know, John, to visit the museum this past November, and it was a great experience. My only regret was that I just didn't have enough time to stay. But what I really enjoyed about this podcast was the opportunity to speak with Morris Casey. I've yet to establish exactly how we're related, but that's something we're going to work on. <laughs> but it's also fascinated by Morris's credentials, how he managed to secure three degrees in a fairly short order, and also learn Russian at the same time. And his research on the nexus between Ireland and Russia is surprising and interesting and makes for both compelling reading and listening. So made me happy as a history geek. And, you know, Morris, his career is is brief but brilliant so far. And you contrast that with Patrick Green, a long career in museums, really working to redefine the experience all around the globe and now back to Ireland. Yeah, a really impressive duo. You know, we like to think of our Irish Stew listeners as a community, and here's a community project for everyone to help us spread the good word about the podcast. So, John, every time we roll out a new episode, we lead with a little video that has our intro snippet, and usually some pictures of our guests, etc. So if you're on Twitter, if you're on Facebook, if you're on Instagram, when you see that, Can you give it a share with other people just to get the word out? It'll really help us out. Irish Stew is produced by John Lee, Martin Nutty, and Bill Schultz. Editing, mixing, and mastering by Bill Schultz. Music on Irish Stew was composed and performed by Rosa Nutty, with Donald Bowens on drums, Cahal O'Reardon on bass and synthesizer. For more on Rosa Nutty's music, please visit rosanutty.com. Hold up. 